Hi, my name is Rajiv Sakhuja. You can call me Raj. A big thank you to you for joining my course. This is my fourth course on Udemy. My last course was on Ethereum decentralized application development. That course has been very well received by the students and the blockchain community. There are two reasons why I decided to create this course. Number one, many students enrolled in my Ethereum decentralized application course suggested that I develop a course on hyperledger technologies. Number two, I have seen many development teams struggling to understand this complex technology. Let me explain this. Hyperledger Fabric is a relatively complex technology compared to Ethereum and other blockchain platform. There are way too many moving parts, tools and concepts that need to be learned before a developer can become productive. Information and learning resources are still scarce. So that is another challenge. So the obvious question is, how would this course help? My objective for this course, accelerate learning by carving out an optimal learning path. Here is the approach I've taken. I'll cover only the knowledge areas that are absolutely needed for a developer to become productive. I've selected the right set of tools and will assist in addressing common tools and setup related issues. We'll carve out that optimal learning path. Please note, this course is on development, so I will not be covering the details of Hyperledger infrastructure architecture or tools that are not needed for development. Let's go over the main parts of the course. Number one, we'll start by covering what is Hyperledger. Then we'll lay out the foundation. You will learn the concept of fabric distributed ledger technology. By end of this part, you would be comfortable with the concepts and terminology of Hyperledger Fabric and Composer Framework. Then, it would be time to get ready for the development. So we'll install a number of tools on your machine. You will learn about each of these tools and you will be asked to try these tools out on your own by way of exercises. There are some known challenges with some of these tools, but no issues. I'll share the solutions. Then we'll dive deeper into the working of Hyperledger Fabric technology. As part of this, I'll walk you through the configuration and setup of the Fabric development environment. Now this is where the fun begins. I'll introduce you to a fictitious airline company that has decided to go forward with the adoption of Hyperledger Fabric technology. So you will help them realize their dreams. Then you will learn Composer Business Domain Modeling Language. Using that, you would develop domain model for Acme Airline. You will learn the Composer API and then use those APIs for developing chain code or smart contract in JavaScript. Using the knowledge of Composer SDK, you will write client code that can be used in node-based mid-tier applications. At the end, you will be given the responsibility to independently develop a network application for Acme. That is, you will do a project, an assignment. So let's get going. But before that, a few suggestions to get the most out of this course. Number one, get your hands dirty as much as possible. Code, code, code. That is the best way to get up to speed with development. Number two, don't be afraid to experiment. Number three, use the Q&A forum to discuss your experience, your issues, your thoughts. Number four, if you are having trouble, start by searching in the Q&A forum. If you don't find anything, Post a new question. Reach out to me directly if you need help. Last but not least, I need your help. Hyperledger technology is still evolving. Things will change. So please do let me know if you see something that needs to be updated or added. Do provide your feedback. Just one request there. Spend some time in the beginning to scan all the sections to get a feel of what's coming. Concepts can be boring and sometimes hands-on exercises may not be possible. Video and audio errors are possible and can easily be rectified. Just let me know. Focus is on composer development tools. So, course will not cover all of the tools in great details if they are not related to the development. Once again, thank you for joining my course. I hope you enjoy this course as much as I did creating it and happy learning and see you in the class.
What is Hyperledger? In this lecture, you'll learn about the Hyperledger project, which is a umbrella project under Linux Foundation. You'll also learn about the Hyperledger Fabric and Composer initiatives. At the end of this lecture, you will have a good understanding of the relationship between uh, Hyperledger Project, Linux Foundation, Fabric, and Composer. Let's start with what is Hyperledger. Hyperledger is an umbrella project of open source blockchain and related tools started in December 2015 by the Linux Foundation. In essence, Hyperledger does not refer to a specific technology or tool. It refers to a project under which multiple development teams are collaborating to create open source blockchain and distributed ledger technologies. This collaboration among the developers across multiple initiatives would lead to reuse, standardization, and interoperability between different blockchain technologies developed under the Hyperledger umbrella. The Linux Foundation since 2000 has delivered many open source projects and at this point Hyperledger is one of the projects under the Linux Foundation. The Linux Foundation is dedicated to building sustainable ecosystem around open source projects to accelerate technology development and commercial adoption. The Linux Foundation has dedicated staff and all the initiatives are funded via the membership fees. These are some of the members. As of 2017, there are 800 plus members and 50 plus active projects under the Linux Foundation. Under Linux Foundation, Hyperledger is the incubator for blockchain technologies for business. All of the Hyperledger initiatives are put in one of two categories. The first category is the DLT frameworks and the second category is the tools. There are four active DLT framework initiatives. Sawtooth is led by Intel. Iroha is led by Suramitsu. IBM donated the source code for its blockchain initiative called Open Blockchain, and that combined with the source code from some other partners such as Digital Assets incubated the Hyperledger Fabric project. Most recent addition is the Hyperledger Burrow from Monex. Monex is known for its work on creating a permissioned chain on top of Ethereum blockchain technology. Second category of initiative is the tools. There are four active tool projects. Cello is an initiative that aims to simplify creation and management of blockchain infrastructure. Composer is for creating business network applications using the high-level Composer language. Explorer provides visibility into an operational blockchain system. Quilt aims to achieve interoperability between different chains. The idea behind all of these tools is that they will be reusable across the various distributed ledger technology frameworks. For example, irrespective of which hyperledger distributed ledger technology you would use, you may use the explorer to gain visibility into the transactions, blocks, etc. In this course, the focus is on Hyperledger Fabric and the Composer tool. If you're interested in learning more about these projects, please refer to the links in the resources for this lecture. There are over 159 engineers from 28 plus organizations involved in the Hyperledger Fabric initiative. The version 1.0 of Fabric was released on July 11th, 2017. It is production ready at this point. The Hyperledger Fabric is evolving at a very rapid pace. And I suggest that you join the Hyperledger community to stay up to date on Hyperledger initiatives. Please visit hyperledger.org community and explore all the options you have here. Let's go back to what is Fabric. Fabric is a production-ready blockchain framework for creating business blockchain application. Framework here refers to the fact that Hyperledger is not a ready platform like, uh, for example, an RDBMS database such as Oracle or web server such as Apache, which can be installed and used out of the box. Rather, Fabric is a framework that provides a set of infrastructure and application building blocks. Also, it provides practices and guidelines for creating 
blockchain business applications. To use this framework, you would need to analyze your blockchain application requirements and then create the infrastructure design that would involve use of the fabric building blocks. Also, when you are writing the software for the blockchain application on Fabric, you would need to have the knowledge of the standard components and APIs and functions. Let's summarize. In this lecture, I covered the relationship between Hyperledger, Hyperledger Fabric, and Linux Foundation. Hyperledger is an incubator for blockchain technologies. It's an umbrella project hosted by the Linux Foundation. Hyperledger Fabric is one of the distributed ledger technology framework initiatives. And Hyperledger Composer is a blockchain tool for creating business application on the Hyperledger DLT frameworks. Distributed ledger technology. In this lecture, I'll explain by way of an example, what is distributed ledger technology. I'll also touch on the typical challenges associated with the distributed ledger technology. At a high level, Think of Hyperledger Fabric as a platform that enables the businesses to create decentralized system for exchange of value. Now, if I ask you which industry involves exchange of value, what would you say? If you said all, then you're right because all businesses are involved in exchange of some form of value. For example, retail industry is all about exchanging goods for cash, financial industry deals with exchange of stocks and bonds, and you can easily figure out the value exchanges that takes place in other industries. In the context of Hyperledger, there is a concept of an asset. An asset represents the value. Assets can be tangible. That is, they are things that you can touch and feel in physical world, or the assets may be intangible. For example, a car is a tangible asset. A home is a tangible asset. Whereas stock ownership certificate and customer reward points are intangible assets. Now that you know what an asset is, let's talk about the exchange aspect of the asset. All enterprises are required to keep track of all business transactions related to the assets in a book of records. This book of record keep track of how things of value or assets are being exchanged by the business with other businesses or entities. For example, a car manufacturer builds the car, that is an asset. This fact is recorded in the car company's book of records. The car company then transfers the ownership of the car to the dealer. And this exchange is recorded by the car manufacturer in its book of records. Dealer has its own book of records and it records the fact that it received the car from the manufacturer. At some point, the dealer transfers the ownership of the car to a customer and it is recorded in the dealer's book of record. These book of records are basically the ledgers maintained by each of these entities. That is, the car manufacturer is maintaining its own ledger and the car dealer is maintaining its own ledger. So in essence, the ledger is the book of record which is maintained by each of the entities involved in the exchange of value. And the entities do not have visibility into each other's book of records or the ledger. Now, till now, I have talked only about the car manufacturer and the car dealer, but the car manufacturer does not create or build all the parts that go into the car. Mostly, the car manufacturer actually procures the parts for the car from other businesses. And each of these businesses have their own ledgers. Now, in this picture, every entity that is involved in the exchange of either parts or the car, which are all assets, is managing their own ledger. Let's say we have to answer this question now. What is the history of this specific car? The customer who owns the car can give us information about the dealer. We can check dealer's ledger to understand where the dealer received the car. Then we can check the manufacturer's ledger to understand where all the parts came from. So we get good historical idea about the car that the customer owns. But what if that car has exchanged multiple hands by way of sales? Then things get complicated because 
the customers are not managing any such ledger or book of records. Let's consider another question. What is the source of each part in the car? In this case, we can get the information on where the manufacturer procured the parts from. But then each of the parts suppliers are getting their raw material from other manufacturers. And as expected, this chains of books become pretty complicated quite fast. And as a result, it may not be easy to answer such questions. In some industries, it is important and sometimes time critical to get visibility into such kind of information. Two such industries are the aircraft manufacturing industry and the food and beverage industry. If there is an air crash due to a part failure, the investigators look for the part responsible for the crash. This is a time sensitive issue as the faulty part in other aircraft may cause more accidents. Same way in the food industry, it is important to track the source of contaminated food in as little time as possible. Using the books of various entities is not the most efficient way to do that. Distributed ledger provides a way to address this challenge. Here is a simplified view of how distributed ledger technology works. Each entity involved in the exchange of value holds a replica or copy of the common book of records referred to as the distributed ledger. All transactions are recorded by various entities in this distributed ledger. A transaction for creation of car is initiated by the manufacturer. It gets recorded not only in the copy of the distributed ledger held by the manufacturer, but it also gets reflected in the dealer's copy of the ledger. Same way, transfer of car ownership by manufacturer and then by the dealer is also recorded in the same ledger. The distributed ledger technology implementation has to deal with multiple challenges. The first one is to maintain consistency across the copies of the ledger. That is, all participants see the same data in the transactions and all of the transactions are in the right order at all times. Another set of challenges is the privacy and the confidentiality aspect. Participants may not want their identities to be disclosed. So the DLT technology has to provide some way to manage that aspect. Confidentiality refers to how only the authorized parties can have visibility into the transactions. Another set of challenges associated with the distributed ledger technology implementation are scalability, interoperability, and standardization. Hyperledger Fabric is a DLT framework that addresses most of the typical challenges associated with the realization of architecture that leverages distributed ledgers. I started this lecture by describing Hyperledger Fabric as a decentralized system for exchange of value. The decentralization is achieved by way of the distributed ledger, that is a ledger which is shared by all the participants in the business. The asset created by the manufacturer is added to the ledger and then anytime the ownership changes for the asset, it is recorded in the ledger as a transaction. Distributed ledger technology for business applications. In this lecture, I'll talk about the characteristics that are desired in a distributed ledger technology for creating business applications. At the end of this lecture, you will understand at a high level why Hyperledger Fabric is suitable for creating distributed ledger technology-based business applications. Hyperledger Fabric is a distributed ledger technology for the business. The key word here is the business that differentiate the Hyperledger Fabric from other blockchain technologies that are geared more toward the public domain. Two such dominant public domain distributed technology networks are the Ethereum and the Bitcoin networks. Business application would require the distributed ledger system to have certain characteristics, which may be different from the characteristics desired in a public domain distributed ledger technology. There are four characteristics that makes uh, Hyperledger Fabric suitable for implementing DLT-based business applications. Hyperledger Fabric is a permission network. It supports confidential transactions and to participate, one does not need cryptocurrency. 
and it is programmable. With these characteristics, Hyperledger Fabric establishes trust, transparency, and accountability among the participants in the network. Hyperledger Fabric allows businesses to create permission network. The Hyperledger Fabric provides ways by which owners of the network can restrict who can access and do what on the network. It requires participants in the network to be known. And to join the network, the participants have to get permissions from some authority. Compare this with the public DLT platform such as Ethereum, where anyone can participate on the network as it is a permission-less network. Hyperledge of Fabric provide ways by which the roles are assigned to the participant and actions that can be taken by each of those roles are restricted by way of access control list. Transactions are validated by a known set of validators that the participants trust. Since all participants are known in a business setting, it is easy to identify or establish those trust authorities or transaction validators. Compare this with a public network where everyone is anonymous and there is lack of trust among the participant. That is why in those public networks such as Ethereum, resource intensive validation schemes are used. Another characteristic that is desired for business applications is the confidentiality of the transactions. Not all transactions are desired by the business to be visible to all. Hyperledger Fabric puts participants in control of the visibility of their transactions. Consider the scenario where A, B, and C are engaged in carrying out business on a DLT-based application. So any transaction initiated by any of these entities will be visible to all of these participants. Now, if B and C would like to engage in some kind of business activity that requires them to restrict the visibility of the transaction to only two of them, then they can create a private channel to carry out such business. Any transaction initiated by B or C on this private channel will be visible only to B and C. Business using Hyperledger Fabric can create and participate on multiple such private channels or networks. Hyperledger Fabric does not have any concept of cryptocurrencies. Let me explain to you why it's not needed by comparing it with the public distributed ledger platforms such as Ethereum. Now, Ethereum uses cryptocurrency to incentivize the distributed ledger network. Transactions on Ethereum are validated by miners who get paid in cryptocurrencies that they can exchange for the fiat currency. This kind of transaction validation scheme is not needed in case of a business DLT application. In other words, there is no need to incentivize the network using cryptocurrencies. Hyperledger Fabric allows participants to decide on who the validators would be and what kind of policies will be used for transaction validation. Typical public domain transaction validation schemes such as proof of work, which is very resource intensive, is not applicable and is not needed for uh, distributed ledger business applications. Hyperledger Fabric is programmable by way of the construct called the chain code. Conceptually, chain code is the same as the smart contract on other distributed ledger technologies. Businesses can use the chain code to automate the business processes. Chain code sits next to the ledger and participants of the network can execute the chain code in the context of a transaction that gets recorded in the ledger. Automation of business process by way of a chain code leads to higher efficiency, transparency, and greater trust among the participants. Let's summarize. There are four characteristics that make Hyperledger Fabric ideal for building distributed ledger-based business applications. Hyperledger Fabric allows participants to create permissioned distributed ledger technology-based business applications. Participants may leverage the private channels for managing confidentiality of the transactions. That is, transaction visibility is restricted to select parties in the network. Now, unlike 
public networks, hyperledger fabric business applications do not require mining and expensive computations for transaction validation. There is no concept of cryptocurrency in Hyperledger Fabric. The chain code construct available on Hyperledger Fabric can be used for automation of the business processes and for building business logic. The chain code is conceptually the same as the smart contract on other distributed ledger technology platforms. Hyperledger concepts. In this lecture, I'll cover assets, chain code, and ledger. At the end of this lecture, you should be able to explain the relationship between assets, chain code, and ledger. As discussed in the lecture on distributed ledgers, assets represent some kind of value that can be exchanged on the blockchain systems. Any object of value in the real world may be represented as an asset on Hyperledger fabric, as long as it can be represented digitally. On Hyperledger Fabric, the asset representation may be JSON or in binary format. For example, a simplified representation of the car will have two attributes in the JSON representation, the VIN number field that uniquely identifies the car and the owner of the car. This second field that is the owner can change as a result of a sale of the car. In effect, we are saying that the state of the asset may change over time. These state changes can take place on Hyperledger fabric only by way of well-defined transactions that are coded in chain code. Chain code defines the structure of the asset. It also defines the transactions that can be executed against the asset. It has all of the business logic needed for the transaction. In the case of the example of a car, there can be a function sell the car defined in the chain code. And call to this function will lead to the transfer of ownership of specific car to the new owner. All transactions are recorded in a ledger. Ledger is a data structure that keeps track of all of these transactions. It also records the state changes taking place in the assets as a result of execution of these transactions. And you already know that the ledger in Hyperledger Fabric is distributed. That is, all participants have a replica or copy of the ledger. Let's summarize. In this lecture, I introduce you to the concept of assets, chain code, and ledger. Assets represent anything of value in the physical world. Chain code is used for defining the structure of the asset, which can be binary or JSON representation. Chain code is also used for coding the transactions that can be executed against the assets. When the chain code is executed, it leads to the addition of the transaction information in the ledger. Ledger also keep track of the state of the asset. Hyperledger concepts. Fabric is a permission network. What that means is that there is a need to assign identities to the participants in the network. In this lecture, at a high level, you will learn about how the identities are created and managed on Hyperledger Fabric by way of membership service provider component. Businesses deal with known entities. Businesses have B2B partners, for example, suppliers of raw material or purchaser of goods. In some industries, by law, businesses are supposed to interact with only known entities, for example, banking industry. Banks must know the identity of every single customer it has. Then there are regulatory agencies that interact with the businesses. A distributed ledger technology-based application for businesses, in effect, would require support for managing identities on the distributed ledger network. Now you have already learned that Hyperledger Fabric supports permission blockchain networks. Let's go a little deeper into what it means. It means that Unlike public networks such as Ethereum, anonymous access to blockchain applications built on Hyperledger is not allowed. Business application defines the roles that are assigned to the participant and access is granted or restricted by way of these roles. An abstract service referred to as the membership service provider takes care of generating the credentials for the various participants. More on this service in a little while. Let's define the term member. 
In the context of hyperledger, a member refers to a legally separate or independent entity. Here, A, B, and C are legally separate and hence defined as the members of the blockchain network. In case of our car example, these three entities may be the car manufacturer, the car dealer, and the repair shop, each of which are legally independent entities. Identities in the Hyperledger network are managed by way of X509 certificates. When a participant identity is created, the certificate is issued to the participant. Anytime a transaction is initiated by the participant, certificate's private key is used for signing the transaction and any component in the network can validate the authenticity of the transaction by using the participant's public key. Interestingly, on Hyperledger, it is not only the participants that are issued the certificate, even the infrastructure components are assigned an identity by way of certificates. This is to prevent a scenario where hackers can add a server to the network, for example, to disrupt the network or to make an attempt to manipulate the transactions. In effect, every single infrastructure component in the Hyperledger network must have a valid certificate to become part of the network. Members are the legally separate entities, and so even they are assigned an identity by way of a certificate. Certificates follow the typical process of issuance and refugation by the certification authorities in the network. Members can manage the identities within their organization. This aspect will remove the dependency on a single centralized certification authority. And this is achieved by way of implementing the concept of membership service providers, where the member can use their certificate to create new valid identities that can participate on the network. So in other words, member can create new participant certificates that associate the participants with the organization or the member by virtue of the certificate chain. Also, member can create the certificate for their infrastructure component. As a result, the Hyperledger Fabric Network can have one or more membership service provider components. Hyperledger is a permission network. All entities participating on the network are known and have an identity which is assigned by way of X509 certificates. Certificates are issued to all participants, infrastructure components, and members. Members are legally separate entities. These are the organizations that have decided to adopt blockchain for process automation. Each of these members are assigned a certificate and depending on their authority, they may be able to use an MSP to create participant and infrastructure component identities within their organization. A blockchain network can have one or more MSPs as shown in this illustration. Hyperledger concepts. At the end of this lecture, you should be able to explain what is a node and what types of nodes are there in Hyperledger fabric. Also, you should be able to explain the concept of channels. The concept of node is common in all blockchain technologies. Think of node as a communication endpoint in a blockchain network. Nodes connect to other nodes and that is how a blockchain network is formed. Nodes use some kind of peer-to-peer -peer protocol for keeping the distributed ledger in sync across the network. In public blockchain networks such as Ethereum and Bitcoins, all nodes are equal and the network looks like this in case of Ethereum. To participate in these public networks, one just needs to download the node software, generally called Wallet, create an account and execute the node. Things on Hyperledger are very different. Let's talk about nodes in the context of Hyperledger. Nodes are the communication entities of the blockchain. Nodes need valid certificates to be able to communicate with the network and the participants use the apps that connect to the network by way of the nodes. Participants identity is not the same as the nodes identity. When the participant execute 
or invoke a transaction, participant's certificate is used for signing that transaction. Node's certificate is used by the network to check if they should trust the node or not. Let's say for the sake of discussion that this node's certificate is either revoked or has expired. In that case, the transaction, though signed by a valid certificate held by the participant, is broadcasted to the network, but the transaction will be rejected because the certificate that node is using has expired or has been revoked. In Hyperledger Fabric, unlike the public domain blockchain technologies such as Ethereum and Bitcoin, all nodes are not equal. There are three distinct type of nodes. First one is the client node. This is the node that applications use for initiating the transactions. Peers are the nodes that keep the ledger in sync across the network. Orders are the communication backbone for the blockchain network. They are responsible for the distribution of transactions. Members can participate on multiple Hyperledger blockchain networks. The transaction in each network is isolated and this is made possible by way of what is referred to as the channel. Peers connect to the channels and they can receive all the transactions that are getting broadcasted on that channel. The channel has its own independent ledger. In other words, if there are two channels, there are two different ledgers maintained in each of these channels and there is no visibility for a peer connected to one channel into the ledger of another channel. Consider this example where there are five members and they have decided to launch a blockchain network. Here, as you can see, there is a single channel and there is a ledger and the chain code that's available on that channel to all five members. Now let's say C and E decided to have some kind of a deal wherein they want their transactions to be private. So what they can do is they can create a private channel. So in this scenario, A, B and D are connected to the common channel, whereas C and E are also part of that common channel. And wrong with that, they have created this private channel. The ledger and chain code for the private channel is independent and isolated from the ledger and chain code for the common channel. Here's another scenario. Let's say B, C, and E have decided to launch a blockchain network and all their transactions are visible only to B, C, and E. And then A, B, C, D also decide to launch a network on which they carry out certain specific kind of transactions. So in this scenario, there is no common channel across the members. There are two separate channels used for maybe different type of transactions. And on one channel, the visibility of the transactions is restricted to A, B, C, D, whereas on the other channel, the visibility of transactions is restricted to B, C, E. And B and C are the members that are participating in both channels, so they have visibility into both the ledgers in these two channels. Let's summarize. In this lecture, I talked about the node and the channel. In Hyperledger Fabric, all nodes are not equal. This is different from the public chain where all nodes are equal. There are three different type of nodes in Hyperledger Fabric. First one is the client that is used by the participant to initiate transaction. Second one is the peers that take care of uh, keeping the ledger in sync with the network. And the third one is Orderer, which provides the communication backbone for the blockchain network. Members can participate on multiple Hyperledger blockchain networks by way of private channels. Each channel manages its own independent and isolated ledger. In this lecture, I'll introduce you to the Fabric Composer. What is Fabric Composer? Why you should consider using Fabric Composer? And then I'll give you a high-level overview of the various tools and runtime environments that makes up the Fabric Composer. 
I'll also give you a high level overview of the process used for creating business network application using the Composer tool sets. Let's begin with what is Composer. Now Composer is a Hyperledger open development tool set that makes it easy for teams to create and manage business network applications that are deployed on the Hyperledger technologies. Now the primary goal, and I'll quote the Composer dev team, the primary goal is to accelerate the development of blockchain applications on Hyperledger. In fact, apart from reduced time to market, there are other benefits of using Composer. It hides the complexity of the underlying infrastructure. Composer also offers business modeling capability by way of a modeling language that can easily be used by non-technical team members such as business analysts. The smart contracts or transactions may be coded in JavaScript, which most developers are familiar with. So it becomes easy to write and manage smart contracts. The Composer development tool set consists of multiple tools geared towards the developers and the architects, the operators of the network. These are the folks who need visibility into the network. Then there are tools for the administrators. Those are the folks who would manage the policies on the network or create participant identities on the network. And then there are tools for the business analyst. The developer and the business analyst create the business network applications that get deployed on the composer runtime. There are multiple types of composer runtimes. Let me explain to you the development process at a high level. The domain expert, such as the business analyst, uses the composer modeling language to create the business network model. The composer modeling language is an object-oriented language for defining the domain model for the business network. The developer takes the business network model and codes the transaction specification in the business network model in JavaScript to create a final application that consists of the JavaScript-based transactions and the business domain model in the composer modeling language. The administrator uses the composer tool to deploy the business network application to the execution runtime. The execution runtime is based on the Hyperledger Fabric 1.x, and this is the blockchain network on which the application gets deployed. The operator uses the tools to maintain good health of the application on the business network. Now, this is just one of the execution runtimes. There are two other execution runtimes which are used by the business analyst and the developers. The second type of runtime environment is referred to as the playground. It is primarily used by the business domain experts and the developers. The playground is available as a web application. So there is a web UI that is used by the domain experts and the developers to create the business network model. The business network model created by way of the playground is stored in the browser local storage. The other purpose for the playground is for simulated testing of the business network application. The third type of execution runtime environment is referred to as the embedded environment. The idea of embedded environment is that the developers can code the business network application and then deploy it in a node-based embedded simulator to test out the application. All of the execution is carried out in memory. Primarily, the embedded environment enables test-driven development and unit testing. Let's summarize. In this lecture, I introduced the Fabric Composer. It is an open development tool set. The primary goal is to reduce the time for development of the business network application. It offers multiple tools which are geared towards the domain experts, developers, administrators, and the operators of the network. The Composer domain modeling language can be used by domain experts to create the domain model for the applications. Composer toolset also offers three types of execution runtime environments for the business network application. The Hyperledger Fabric 1x infrastructure, think of it as the production or the live network environment. Playground, 
which is a web-based application that allows the development of domain models and it also allows simulation-based testing of business network application. The third type is node-based simulator, referred to as the embedded runtime. It is primarily used for test-driven development and unit testing. Development machine for this course. As part of this course, you will be downloading and installing multiple tools on your machine. You will also be coding Hyperledger Fabric Composer applications. For all of those activities, you will need a decent machine. In this lecture, I'll describe the minimal configuration that you need to have on your machine in order to be able to carry out all the exercises. I will also touch on the use of Visual Studio Code for development of applications. To try out the tools and the code that I have used and demonstrated in the videos for this course, you would need a decent sized machine. 4 GB RAM is the minimum you need. 8 GB and above is going to be really good. And you would also need a decent internet connection as you will be downloading many softwares. It doesn't matter whether you are using Windows, Ubuntu or Mac, as long as you're using the right versions. From the Windows perspective, I have tried out the code on version 7 and version 10 home edition. From Ubuntu perspective, you can use 14.04 or 16.04 LTS. From the Mac OS perspective 10.12 or anything above is good. For the development of this course, I have used four machines. Let me give you the description of all the machines that have been used for testing out the tools and the code that I have demonstrated in this course. Mac OS, MacBook Pro mid-2012 with the 16 GB RAM, 10.11.16 version of the OS. Windows 7, which is an i5 Intel Core, 8 GB RAM, Windows 10 Home, it is a HP desktop, Intel Core i7, 8 GB RAM, and then I have used Ubuntu on AWS, mid-size machine with Ubuntu 14.04. I suggest that you download and install Visual Studio Code on your machine. Visual Studio Code is available on Windows, Linux, as well as Mac. Link for download is available in the resources for this lecture. In this course, I will use the Docker extension and the Hyperledger Composer extension for Visual Studio Code. You may go ahead and install these extensions now, or you will see how to install these extensions in later lectures. Composer Development Tools Installation. In this lecture, I'll go over the instructions for installing the prerequisites for the Composer Development Tools. Then I'll go over the instructions for the Composer Tools for the installation of CLI, Yo Generator and the REST server. All links that I have referred to are available in the resources for this lecture. Please note that the version of prerequisite software that I have used is valid as of December 2017. The version of prerequisite software will change over a period of time. I would suggest that you refer to the documentation to ensure that you are installing the right versions. Mac and Ubuntu users have a choice. They can either follow the instructions that I have provided for installing the prereqs, or they can use the instructions provided by the Composer developer team. So if you're a Mac user, you have a choice. You can use the Mac OS prerequisite installation instructions, which are available in the Composer documentation. The link is in the resources. And if you are a Ubuntu user, then you may use the script for the prerequisites installation, and that script is shown in action in the lecture on Ubuntu development environment setup. Link is in the resources. The Composer tools have been developed using Node. The version of Node that you need to install in your machine is Node version 8.x. Keep in mind, version 9 is not supported. Just go ahead and download the Node and install it on your machine. The link is in the resources. If you already have Node on your machine, run the command node-v to check if you are using version 8. If not, you need to update it. Sometimes developers have to support multiple versions of Node on their machine. If that is the situation with you, then I would suggest that you install NVM on your machine. NVM supports installation of multiple Node versions on the machine. Originally, NVM was developed for macOS, but there is also a NVM version available for Windows. The development teams for the Mac OS NVM and the Windows NVM are different. Just keep that in mind. Though both the tools provide the same features, there may be subtle differences. The link to the Mac OS and the Windows NVM tool is available in the resources. 
Next one is Git. You need to have version 2.9 or higher of Git client installed on your machine. And if you already have it, you can check the version of uh, the Git client by using the command git dash dash version. Composer tools require Python 2.7. Make sure you download the right version because there is also a version 3.6 of Python. And once you have installed Python 2.7, make sure it's added to the path. If you already have Python, just run Python dash V to get the version of Python and make sure it is 2.7. Yeoman is a NPM package for Node. You can install Yeoman by using npm install dash g yo. And you can read more about Yeoman at yeoman.io. The first tool that we are going to install is the composer command line interface. And this tool can be installed by using the npm install dash g composer dash cli. Once the tool is installed, you can verify if it's working by running composer dash v. It'll give you the version of the tool that's installed on your machine. Now, one thing to remember here is that some of these tools that we're gonna install are dependent on the native compiler and native build tools. And when you install these tools, you may run into some trouble, especially on Windows. And you would have to follow the instructions on this link that's provided to see what you have to do in order to fix it. So here you would find this node-zip package documentation. And as you can see, there are instructions for some uh, build tools to be added. For example, macOS requires you to install Xcode. On Windows, you need to install the Windows build tool. So please go through these instructions and install the required uh, elements before moving forward. The second composer tool that we're going to install is the composer rest server. To install it, you will use the instruction npm install minus g composer dash rest dash server. And once it's installed, you have to verify it by running composer dash rest dash server dash v. And it'll give you the version of the composer rest server that's installed on your machine. The third composer tool is a Yeoman generator. And to install the Yeoman generator for Hyperledger, you would use the command npm install minus g generator dash Hyperledger dash composer. This particular generator creates Skeleton business network application. You will learn about this and uh, other tools in the later lectures. And to verify if the generator was installed, you would use the command your dash dash generators, and you should see this generator in the list that will be printed out by this command. Next tool is a visual code extension for the composer language. The composer language is used for creating domain models for the business network application. This extension provides uh, syntax highlighting and real time validation of the model being developed in the visual code editors. In this lecture, I walked you through the installation process for some of the composer tools. These are the prerequisites that need to be installed before you can install the composer tools. In this lecture, I showed you how to install the composer CLI, that is the command line interface tool, composer rest server, the Yeoman composer generator, and the composer extension for the visual code. In the next few lectures, you will see some of these tools in action. Hyperledger Fabric software is distributed in the form of uh, Docker images. In order to work with the Hyperledger Fabric on your local machine, you will need to install Docker on your machine. Couple of prerequisites for this lecture. You should have a basic understanding of Docker containers and commands, and you should have some knowledge and understanding of uh, virtual machines. Please note that the focus of this course is not Docker. So I'll not be covering all the commands and all the aspects of Docker containers. I'll simply go through some of the common or basic Docker commands that you will need for running the Fabric software. Now, some of you may already have Docker on your machine. So in that case, I would suggest that you run the command docker-v to check if you have the right version of Docker installed on your machine. If you have the right version, then you can skip the rest of this lecture because you already are set up with Docker. If your version is lower than 17.03, then you need to upgrade your Docker. 
Docker containers require native support for virtualization. So if you are using Windows 10 Professional or if you're using Al Capitan 1011 or higher on the Mac, then you are good to go with the Docker installation. Otherwise, you will have to install the Docker Toolbox. Now, Docker Toolbox is supported on Windows 10 Home, all lower versions of uh, Windows, and the older Mac machines. Please read about the difference between the Docker containers and the Docker Toolbox on your own. The link is in the resources. This is the page for downloading the Docker Community Edition. The link to this page is available in the resources. You can select the platform on which you want to install Docker and download it by using the links provided. Now, one thing to note here is that uh, Docker CE or Community Edition for Windows is available only for Windows 10 Pro at this time. For other versions of Windows, you need to use the toolbox. And here, as you can see, the Docker for Windows requires Windows 10 Professional and the Enterprise 64 bit for previous versions need to install Docker Toolbox. In this course, I'll be using Mac and Windows 10 Home for all demos and all uh, walkthroughs. On Mac, the installation is pretty straightforward. Just one point to note is that uh, you can download uh, Docker from the stable channel or the edge channel. My recommendation is that you go with the stable channel because the edge channel download has many experimental features which we are not going to use anyway. Once you download it, you simply drag the docker.app to the applications folder and that's about it. Similarly, on uh, Windows 10 professional version, pick up the stable channel. This is the download page for Docker Toolbox. I will be installing the Docker Toolbox on my Windows 10 home version. So let's go ahead and do that. The download will take a couple of minutes. Once the download is complete, just click on the downloaded exe and follow the instructions. Once the installation process has finished, you can simply restart the machine and you are ready to use the Docker toolbox. After the restart, click on Docker Quick Start. And in the Docker Quick Start, the first thing it does is it checks the configuration of your machine and it may indicate to you that you need to make a BIOS change. So these are the parameters that need to be configured in the BIOS. Now, the changes that you need to make will depend on your machine. So please check the documentation for your machine as to how you can update your BIOS. I'm using a HP machine that uh, requires me to press on F10 to bring up the BIOS configuration as the machine is starting up. You need to check your own machine to see which key you need to use for setting up the BIOS. Under the HP BIOS, I have uh, to select system security. And as you can see here, the virtualization technology VTX slash VTD is disabled. So I have enabled it, saved and exited, and restarted the machine. Now I'm launching the quick start for Docker. And as you can see, it carries out some uh, setup on your local machine. It'll take some time to complete this setup. Once the setup is complete, you will see a window like this. Let's make sure the setup is working. I'm just going to execute the command docker run hello-world. And as you can see this message here, hello from Docker indicates that our Docker setup is working. Now launch a command prompt and type docker ps. Here, we're getting an error. What this indicates is that we need to set up the environment variables for Docker. Open the quick start terminal and run the command env pipe grep docker underscore. And this would list out all the environment variables in the quick start terminal that uh, the Docker commands need to use. And the next thing you do is go to the control panel and open the section where you can create new environment variables and create the environment variables that you see on the quick start terminal and use the right values for each of these variables. Once you have done that, hit OK and save the setup. Open a new command shell and simply type docker run hello world, hit enter. And this time it ran without issues. 
Docker Toolbox also installs the Oracle VirtualBox. Oracle VirtualBox is a software that allows the creation of virtual machines in software. So machines that do not have support for native virtualization or hardware-based virtualization can use VirtualBox for creating and managing those virtual machines using VirtualBox. And this is all software-based. In fact, as you can see here, there is a running virtual machine. I can log into it. So you will see that this virtual machine is like any other Unix-based virtual machine and you can run any command on it. The Docker containers are created in these virtual machines. Now, one thing you will notice here is that uh, all the parameters of the virtual machine are here. And you can easily change these virtual machine parameters by clicking on, for example, the system here and changing the memory. The reason it is disabled now is because the virtual machine is active, but you can stop it and make the changes. In fact, in a later lecture, I'll show you how to quickly do that. Not only that, you can create multiple virtual machines and work with those. In this course, you will be learning a lot of tools. You will be coding some uh, business network applications. And to do that, you would need a development environment. The development environment can be created either by installing all the Hyperledger Fabric components on your machine, your desktop, your laptop, or you can use a virtual machine for creating the development environment. In this lecture, I'll describe both the environments and then you'll have to make a decision on whether you want to install Hyperledger Fabric natively or whether you want to go with the virtual machine based mechanism. Now keep in mind that it's not a mutually exclusive decision. You can decide to do both if you want. Let's start with this term, dependency hell. Dependency hell refers to a frustrating experience that the software developers have to go through when they are installing software that have dependency on other softwares or specific versions of other software. Unfortunately, in its current state, Hyperledger Fabric has a lot of dependencies. Before you can install your Hyperledger Fabric uh, Docker containers, you need to have all of these softwares installed on your machine, which at times can be a challenge. Let me share the student experience with native installation of Hyperledger Fabric. Native installation means you will install the various components of Hyperledger Fabric on your own machine, not in a virtual machine. What I have observed is that most of the time, the Linux users are able to get their dev setup very quickly. And the reason is because most of the installation steps are automated. The Mac users are somewhere between the Windows users and the Linux users. The Windows users are the ones who struggle the most. There are many, many problems that have been reported and resolved in the past couple of months. So it's not that it doesn't work, it's just that it'll take you more time if you are on Windows to install and get your Hyperledger Fabric environment up and running. So the obvious question is, what are the choices? The choices are, you can have a native installation where the Hyperledger Fabric components are installed on your machine, or you can install Hyperledger Fabric in a virtual machine. I'll compare the two choices suggested here. The native installation requires you to carry out uh, installation of various softwares. So it takes some time, especially if you run into issues. Virtual machine installation is quite fast compared to the native installation. Native installation requires you to execute certain manual steps, whereas virtual machine installation is all automated. Version clashes and other issues are common in the native installation, especially on the Windows platform, whereas the virtual machine installation is self-contained and the versions are managed internally. It's easy to clean up the virtual machine rather than to uninstall the various components on the native installation. So here is my suggestion, but the end decision is yours. If you're using a supported Linux OS, then go with the native installation. For Mac OS, go with the native installation. Even for the newer versions of Windows, such as Windows 10 Pro, go with the native installation. But if you're using Windows 10 Home or some earlier version of Windows, then I would suggest that you start with the VM-based setup and later do the native installation. The instructions for setting up Hyperledger Fabric in a virtual machine 
are covered in the lectures in this section. So continue with the lectures in this section if you are going with the VM based installation. The native installation is covered in the next section. So what that means is that if you plan to go with the native installation, you can skip the rest of the lectures in this section and go straight to the next section. Dev setup overview. In this lecture, I'll talk about virtualization and the virtualization software that we are going to use for setup of the VM-based dev environment for Hyperledger Fabric. The two softwares that I'm going to discuss are the Oracle VirtualBox and the open source tool Vagrant. I'll also describe how the VM-based dev environment setup will work. Let's start with what is virtualization. Virtualization is a software simulation of the physical hardware. What that means is that on a single machine, you can create multiple virtual machines which are all implemented in software and each of these virtual machines behave as if they are independent physical machines. To create the virtual machines on a single host machine or physical machine, you need to have a class of software on your machine known as the hypervisor. Hypervisor is the virtualization system that creates and runs the virtual machines. There are multiple hypervisor solutions available in the market today. The Oracle VirtualBox is a free hypervisor solution that we're going to use in this course. Now let's talk about how we will set up your machine. What we'll do is we will install the VirtualBox on your machine and then we will create a virtual machine on which we will install Ubuntu. And then we will install all the Hyperledger Fabric components on it. But if you go in this direction, then to carry out all the development activities, or to use the tools, we will always have to log into the virtual machine. And that can be very cumbersome. So the good news is that there is a better solution. Obviously there is a trade-off, but it's a better solution. Let me explain how we will go forward. I call this setup the mix mode setup. In this setup, we will install the virtual box. We will also install the Vagrant. Don't worry if you don't know what Vagrant is, I'll explain in the next few minutes what Vagrant is. We will use Vagrant to create and manage the virtual machine. On the virtual machine, we will install Ubuntu and install some of the Hyperledger Fabric tools and components. And then we will install the composer tools, the node and the visual studio for code on the host machine. Now the good news is that you have already installed these tools. So this is the suggested way. And here what would happen is that we will use the composer tool to connect with the Hyperledger fabric components installed within the virtual machine by way of the TCP connections. The benefit of this approach is that it will give you the same development experience as a native installation. To execute the tools, you will not have to log into the virtual machine and that will make things much, much easier. Now let's talk about what is Vagrant. Vagrant is a tool for building and managing virtual machine environments in a single workflow by way of automations. It's a command line tool and the workflow for creating and managing the virtual machines is managed by way of a configuration file known as the Vagrant file. Virtual machines are created by executing the Vagrant commands. The Vagrant command checks the Vagrant file for getting the configuration for the virtual machine. Then it invokes the APIs on the virtual box to create the actual virtual machine. Anytime there is a need to change the configuration of the virtual machine, the Vagrant file is updated with a new configuration and then the commands for Vagrant are re-executed to reconfigure the virtual machine. Let's summarize. In this lecture, I described the virtual machine based setup that I refer to as the mixed mode virtual machine setup. In this setup, we will have the Hyperledger fabric installed on a virtual machine that will be set up with the Ubuntu OS. For virtualization, we will use the hypervisor Oracle virtual box and to create and manage the virtual machines, we will use the open source tool Vagrant. All the composer tools will be installed on the host machine and they will connect to the Hyperledger environment by way of TCP connections. Good news is that you have already installed the composer tools on the host. In the next lecture, you will learn 
how to install the Oracle VirtualBox and Vagrant tool.